Today we're going to look at, uh, we're still in this 40 Days of Love, Part 5. And uh, how many of you notice it's kind of hard to do this stuff? I wish we could just preach it and read about it and move on. But it, it's, it's kind of like once you get into it, you start realizing there's a lot of stuff to, to ask God to help you with. And uh, there certainly is. Uh, we're going to take our verse from verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Love is not easily angered. Love is not easily angered. A lot of misunderstanding about anger. Uh, one thing is it's probably the most misunderstood, misapplied emotion of all the emotions that we have as human beings. It, but it's not necessarily a sin. Uh, a lot of people think anger is always sin. Not necessarily some. Sometimes anger is the most appropriate response. Actually, anger is a capacity given to you by God. Uh, God get ang gets angry. And uh, there's sometimes that you should get angry. Uh, sometimes anger is the evidence of love. You know, if somebody was hurting my wife or my kids and I didn't get angry about it, there's something wrong with me. The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is apathy. The, the opposite of love is apathy. It's just I don't care. If you never get angry, it means that you're a vegetable or not a human being. We do counseling sessions with couples. They come in. If we have a couple and they come in and, you know, their marriage is on the rocks and they're about to split and they go, well, you know, this is what your partner wants. And they go, I don't care. And this is, well, this is what your partner, you know, this is what they're saying, their needs and his needs. And I don't care. And they just don't care. They, you you know, it's almost like as a counselor, if we can get them to get mad at with one another or fight, we've, we've accomplished something. Because you only really get angry about what you're emotionally attached to. I mean, you, you've got to have something there. If there's nothing there, then there's just apathy. There's just apathy. And uh, so the opposite of love is apathy. Is you don't care. A little bit of anger helps in marriage. It helps in managing. Uh, it helps to produce good marriages. It produces good leadership. Uh, you know, everybody, sometimes it sets a fire in you to, to change some things. The problem is, as I said, we don't know how to express our anger. It's something that we're basically not taught. Uh, psychiatry today calls this time we're living in the age of rage. It's like people are just raging mad and, and don't know why. Uh, the proper use of anger has not really been taught by most parents or schools or businesses or even, for the biggest part, for most churches. And so what we find to be very clear in the Bible, what uh, is the appropriate and the inappropriate ways of anger. And what we typically do, we go to one extreme or the other. Just because you don't turn and blow up don't mean you don't have anger problems. Some people stuff it in. Usually you're either a turtle or a skunk. <laughs> and a lot of times turtles marry skunks. And skunks marry turtles. One just gets in their shell and hides and, and you know, disappears, you know, when they get angry. They're going to they're gonna, uh, just, uh, so, you know, just they take it in. They're going to be quiet, but they're angry. They're passive in their anger. But a lot of times the skunks, they just blow up and, you know, they stink up the whole room and they get angry. Those are the ones that we normally talk about the most. But a lot of times the, the person that they just kind of uh, hide in their shell and they, they're kind of, uh, they, they use their anger. I'm not going to get mad that you can see it. I'm going to get even. And so they burn your toast or they uh, purposely don't do some things they normally would do. And it's kind of a passive anger. But let me give you a little facts about anger you may not know. For instance, the average woman loses her temper three times a week. How many's got your spouses above average? <laughs> I, I really don't think you should raise your hand right now. <laughs> uh, but I want to say this. You guys, you lose your temper six times a week. How many's got your guys above anger? Hey, above average in anger. Uh, the other thing is, is women normally get angry at people. Men get angry at things. Like that stupid lawnmower, that stupid car, that stupid... You know, it's always some stupid idiot thing. It's a thing. And uh, so women get angry at people and men get angry at machines or things. 
Single adults express their anger twice as often as married adults. That may be the reason they're single. I don't know. If they're expressing twice as much, that means they'd be 12 times for a, a woman and six times for a guy. Uh, men are far, far more physical with their anger than women. And the most likely place to express anger is at your home than anywhere else. Duh. Because those are the relationships that hopefully mean the most to us. And, and we're, we, we usually have let our guard down. And, and so there's more anger in the home than anywhere. Successful marriages are not the marriages where anger or conflict does not exist. But rather where they've learned to manage it. When anger is managed, it produces great marriages and produces great friendships. And great businesses and great athletes. But they have to, it has to be managed. So this week, again, we're going to look at what God has to say about how to tame your temper. The Bible is very clear about this, particularly in the book of Proverbs. God gives us very specific design and principles on which to build the use of anger. Love does not easily anger, the scripture says. So how do we tame the temper? You might need to take notes because you're going to need this sermon Somewhere in your life, I guarantee you. Number one, first thing God says to do if you want to tame your temper is you must resolve to manage it. You must, you have to make a decision to resolve to manage it. In other words, some people want to say, I just can't get control of my anger. Folks, that's a lie. That's a lie. Uh, that is not the truth. And, and when, you, when you start, when you stop making excuses for your anger, and you start realizing that anger is a choice. Just like love is a choice, anger is a choice. And when you get angry, you're choosing to get angry. Nobody's forcing you to get angry. Nobody can make you mad. You make your own self mad. People say, you make me so mad. Nobody can make you mad without your permission. See, the Bible does not teach a victim mentality. Because a victim mentality means somebody's always in control of your life. The Bible wants you to raise up to a point of time when people can't make you mad. They can't make you angry. They can't make you... That you're in control. Don't let other people be in control of your life. And so anger is a choice. And you choose it or you don't choose it. In fact, you have more control over your anger than you want to admit. Let me give you a good example. Let's say you're in a good, steamy argument or like some people like to call it discussion with your spouse and you're going at it pretty hard and the phone rings and you go, hello, how you doing? <laughs> now that's not what you expect from that partner when you see how mad they've been raging and the children see this and everybody sees this, but they can turn it on and they can turn it off anytime they want to, proving once again that anger is a choice. And you must resolve to take responsibility for it and say, I have got to get control of my anger. I am the one. Nobody else. I've got to get a control of my anger. Anger is highly controllable. Don't let anything or anybody control it. You have to make a choice. Anger is a choice. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. A wise man keeps, circle keeps. Keeps means it's a choice, it's a responsibility. When I get angry, I'm choosing to get angry, and I'm not blaming anybody else. When I say resolve to mend your anger, resolve means you make a choice in advance. You take the time to manage your own anger. When you you don't wait until your blood pressure gets up. You don't wait until you're uh you know, your adrenaline is shooting through your system and your face is flushed and your muscles are tight. That's, that's not the time. You have to resolve ahead of time that no one's going to make you angry. You, when you wait that long, you've already lost the battle. You're, you resolve to manage it in advance. Before you go into the meeting, before you open the door, before the day starts, you say, I'm not going to allow anybody to get me angry today. I make it as a choice. Number two, how you do this is by remembering the cost. Every time you get angry, there's a cost. Uh, you know, and so you must you know, tell yourself and understand and, and reflect back on this, the cost, the cost. Uh, there's a price tag to anger. The Bible says in 29 and 22, a hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of trouble. 
You can get you can just circle all kinds. They get into all kinds of trouble. In fact, true confession is good for the soul. So I want to look at some of these areas here. Proverbs 15 and 18. Hot tempers cause arguments. How many agree with that? Hot tempers cause arguments. All right. What about anger causes mistakes? Let me agree with that. Anger causes mistakes. And how about this one? People with hot tempers do foolish things. People with hot tempers do foolish things. Did you know when you get angry, you lose 50% of your IQ? And did you know some of you cannot afford to lose 50% of your IQ? You ever hear anybody just curse and curse? And, it doesn't curse words. That, I mean, it really sounds ignorant, to be honest. And it makes you think they have went to that place where the IQ has been reduced by 50%. Uh, they probably learn it. Watch wrestling or the front. You know, you, you learn it from somebody. And the thing is, you lose. What do you lose? Uh, it tells you there's a lot of things you lose. The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worth while left. You know, there's people that have lost everything. They lost their wife. They lost their kids. They lost their truck. Their dog run away. Sounds like a good country song, doesn't it? Because of anger. What do you lose? You can lose your reputation. People can go, man, I, I thought that person was a better person than that. You, you, you lose the respect of others. You can lose your job. You know, you just try it. You get, you're all mad going to work. You hear the song, take this job and shove it. So you go in there and you tell your boss, man, it makes for a great song, but it'll get you fired. Now you don't have a job because you couldn't control your temper. You didn't use your head. Your IQ was diminished and you didn't use your head. And, and so you, you don't have anything left. It just don't make sense. And, and so you can lose your health. Anger build up and bitterness build up can ruin your health. You work at trying to exercise and eat all the right stuff and then you let anger destroy your body physically. It can make you physically sick. So we need to remember the cost whenever we're tempted to lose our temper. A lot of parents, they have found that if they scream and yell and they raise their voice to a certain pitch, it gets their kids' attention. And they think, well, that's good. You know, when I get my voice right there, my kids, they shape up because they know, you, you know, you're on my last nerve. And, I, and folks, you can get your kids to mind like that for a while, but that is not real good. It, all, is, all you're doing is you're, you're, you're causing that. Later on, they're not going to respect that. You can scare your kids into doing some things by getting angry, but, ang but often... Uh, we, we often use anger to get people's attention because it does work for the short time, but I'm going to tell you, it won't work over the long term. In the long run, there are always three price tags for anger. The price tag for anger is more anger. If you're angry, there's going to be more anger. Follow. If you hit me, I'm probably going to hit you back. And if that hit, and then more and more and more, and it goes, it just gets out of hand. It gets out of hand. And, and so, more anger, you know, anger adds to more anger. All right? And then there's apathy and then alienation. Whenever you get angry at someone, they don't respond well to that. You ever get angry at somebody, they don't normally respond back very nice if you've been angry to them. When people get angry at you, do you want to hang out with them? No. So, you get around angry people, what happens? People don't want to be around you, so they begin to alienate you. They don't invite you to certain things. You, they don't want to be around you. They don't have anything to do with you because people don't like to be around angry people. When people get angry, the first thing is to get angry back. Second is if, if they keep getting angry at you pretty soon, you just become apathetic and you say, I don't care. It's like the parent that's always angry with their child. Their child goes, well, I tell you what, I tried to bring my grades up, but, you know, I, I didn't bring it up as high as they wanted to, so I just don't care no more. They're going to be mad if I do, mad if I don't, so I'm just going to do what I want to do. And see, that apathetic, I don't care attitude was brought on by an angry person. You're just so angry. And a lot of times, a person around, an angry person, you know, you're doing something with them. You're trying to help out. You're trying to be a part of it. But nothing you can do can please an angry person. So you go, 
Fool, you know, you know I'm not going to fool around with you anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. You just do it yourself. I'm not going to be a part of it. And what you happen is you don't care anymore. You don't care to help. You don't care to be a part because all you're going to get is their anger. Well, then finally after the anger, the, you know, the apathy, you don't care anymore. You just don't care. And then the alienation, you don't want to be around them either. And so you keep being angry. The scripture is absolutely right. Pretty soon you're going to be left by yourself all along. Nothing destroys relationship faster than anger. So the third thing the Bible says is that we can do is we need to reflect before reacting. Reflect before reacting. In other words, think before you speak. Put your mind into gear before you put your mouth into gear. Anger control is largely a matter of mouth control. You watch your words. You watch what you say. And the Bible tells us it is foolish to respond impulsively to anything. It, to, to respond impulsively. If you've already, you, you just do it impulsively, normally it's always going to be wrong. You know, when something gets your goat, something takes you off, something irritates you, something makes you mad, the Bible first, the, the Bible says first, resolve to manage it. Then remember the cost of losing your temper. Then reflect before reacting. In other words, don't respond impulsively. Don't let them, let them make you or control you to act in a way that you know you should not act. Proverbs 29 11 says, A stupid man gives free reign to his anger. A wise man waits and lets it grow cool. Circle waits. Well, our third president, Jefferson, he, he was the one that came up and, and started talking about when he gets angry, he would count to 10. Some of you might need to count to 100 or take a walk. But notice a stupid man gives free reign to his anger, but a wise man waits and lets it grow cold. The biblical basis for term chill out or cool it. God says don't, don't respond impulsively. Have you ever noticed that you can't put your foot in your mouth when your mouth is closed? This won't happen. It won't happen. You know, did you know that the average male speaks 25,000 words a day? The average male. The average woman speaks 30,000 words a day. And so when the man gets home, she's still got at least five or 10,000 words to go. And the man's already run out. And he has nothing to talk about. But you know what? I was talking to this guy one time and I asked, does, does it bother you that your wife always has the last word? He said, no, I'm just glad when she gets there. <laughs> so how long do you wait? How much cooling off? The Bible said, you don't just put it away for a year or two years or a month. The Bible said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So cool off for a while. Find the appropriate time and talk to that person. But don't, don't talk. Don't, uh, don't do it in the impulse of anger. The Bible tells us to reflect before reacting. And uh, then, then to delay. What do we do during the delay period? One of the things you need to analyze it. You need to analyze it. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 11, a wise man, in other words, a man of wisdom, gives, it gives him patience. You try, and what patience does, the way you, it takes God giving you patience, it's one of the, the fruit of the Spirit, but also patient is someone that, that takes enough time to put yourself in that other person's shoes and trying to see where they're coming from. In other words, patient causes you to be more understanding. You try to get some wisdom. Uh, you know, what's ticking me off? What's irritating me? What's making me feel this way? This is important. The more you understand your anger, the more understanding you'll be. The more you try to understand your wife, the more understanding you'll be toward your wife or your children. So here are the next three questions you need to ask when reflecting before reacting. You ask yourself, why am I angry? Why did what they said or did, why did that make me angry? See, why did it make you angry? There's something there that caused that anger. That's a good question. You need to stop and ask yourself, what is making me upset right now? The problem is not the problem. The problem is the cause of the problem. The problem is not your anger. Anger is just a symptom. Anger is the warning light. You need to look at what is really making you angry. What is it that's making me angry? Number two, what do I really want? Because there's something you're wanting that you're not getting. There, uh, what do I really want out of this argument? 
What am I wanting here? What am I wanting to get from it? Number three, how can I get it? How can I get what I want from that irritating person right now? How can I do it? While you're doing this, you reflect before reacting. Always. So I want to talk to you about three things that always is the root. It's always the root. You get to it, you find out every time one of these three things is at the heart of your anger. Number one is hurt. When, when you get hurt, physically hurt, emotionally hurt, you get wounded, the natural human response to hurt is to get angry. We all do it. If I'm out nailing a nail and, you know, into some wood and I hit my thumb, I take that hammer and I throw it across the room, that stupid hammer. See, men get more angry with things. Well, is it really the anger and the hammer's fault? No, it's not the hammer. Well, I can blame it on the nail, this stupid, cheap nail. Well, probably not the nail. Or it's this old hard wood with the knots all in it. And I can blame the wood. But you know, if you reflect long enough, you'll get to, it's probably the person operating the hammer. And that's what makes you the maddest because you realize you're actually mad at yourself. But a lot of times when we're mad at ourselves, we project that anger over on other people. We get mad at other people when we really should be mad at ourselves. We should really uh, look at what, you know, what are we really mad about. The second thing that causes you to get angry is frustration. You get so frustrated. Frustration is when you get irritated and you, you, you know, you're not getting the gold that you want. You're not, you're not receiving, getting to the gold you want. When you're forced to wait, you like to have, to, you don't like to wait for something. You know, like traffic jam or waiting. You get behind some slow person. You know, it really makes me mad when I get to Walmart, you know, that dreadful once a week trip to Walmart, and there's some dummy up there that can't count to ten because it's got a sign, ten items only. And they've got 25 items in their buggy. It's like, I will say, hey, can you not count? Does that just bother me or does it bother anybody else? They don't have a fast lane at Walmart that I've ever found. It's just one of those things. But you know, you get frustrated. We, the, the traffic, people, uh, you start getting angry. When I'm, what I'm saying here is frustration is the cause when you feel out of control. You ever feel out of control? And I'm going to tell you something. If your temperament is to be a person in control, then being out of control bothers you the most. It bothers you absolutely the most. In our counseling, we do temperament studies on people. A lot of people, they go, well, my spouse is very controlling or my parents are very controlling. You know what I already know usually when that's said? They're controlling. Because a person that has really no need for control, control doesn't bother them. It's, it's the one that has need for control that if anybody is challenging their control, it bothers them. And so we need to realize, but you realize how many things you're not in control of in your life. You're not controlling who your parents were. You're not in control where you were born. You're, you're not in control where you're going to die, really. You're not in control uh, of so many things in your life. There's so many things that are totally 100% out of your control. And that bothers you. It, it just bothers you not to be out of control. The third cause of anger is fear. When you have fear... You, you fear certain things. Uh, you feel you're being trapped or you feel you're being attacked or you feel afraid. Anger and insecurity uh, are, go together. Whatever you're insecure about, usually you're angry about. Uh, kind of whatever you're not up on, you're down on. When, you, when they don't meet your needs, when they say things that are unkind, they don't respond to what you, you expect them. A lot of times your expectation of people, uh, you need to realize they will not meet your expectation and you make your own self mad. You don't feel appreciated. Every time you look to someone in your life to meet your needs, you're going to usually find out those expectations will not be met sometime in the way because we shouldn't expect other people to, to meet certain needs that only God can meet. These people that get married and they go, you know, you complete me. Well, I want to hear you about six months later. Because that other person never was meant to complete you. 
You need to be 100%. They need to be 100% because it ain't going to be fair for somebody else to be have the sole responsibility of, of completing you. You get complete before you enter into the marriage because nobody likes to have the responsibility of completing another person. And so we get angry when people don't meet our expectations, when our expectations should be given to God. And that's insecurity. We feel the insecurity. Psalms 141 and 3 said, Lord, help me control my tongue. Help me to be careful about what I say. We need God's help to, to control these things. I'm going to tell you another little thing that will cause you to get in trouble, especially with anger. And it, it starts with an A, and it's called alcohol. There's a song out, a country song now, about alcohol can make you wear a lampshade. It can cause you to start a fight with somebody two times, three times bigger than you. And the song is like a song written from the alcohol perspective of all the things alcohol can do. I'm going to tell you, alcohol removes all inhibitions. You may have been sitting back here mad, and of course you wouldn't say it because you're a turtle, but you can throw back a few, you know, uh, you know, bottles of alcohol and pretty soon you're not inhibited anymore. You can just tell anybody whatever you feel. You ever notice that somebody that's drunk, they get louder and louder. <laughs> and, and they're just, uh, and so drinking, the Bible says drinking too much makes you loud and foolish. It's stupid to get drunk, what it says. Unless you're a country western guy and you write a song about it, then it's stupid. Uh, because it, you're, you're not as, uh, you know, you're not in, inhibited. You'll just say whatever comes to your mind. And just tell anybody, I'm going to tell you what I think. <laughs> right now. <laughs> and in the morning you may be beside yourself because nobody <laughs> wanted to hear that. The fourth thing, release my anger appropriately. There are appropriate ways to release anger. There's a right way and a wrong way to express anger. If anger was a sin, then God's a sinner because God gets angry. And, you know, God gets angry when people are raped and people are hurt and people are killed and innocent bystanders and, and people are not respected. It angers God. God was angry and, and Jesus, He ran them out of the temple. And so I must release my anger in appropriate ways. Ephesians 4, 26 says, if you become angry, don't let your anger lead you into sin. It's easy during a point of anger to, to do the wrong thing and sin. Now, pop psychiatry today will tell you that, see, we have, this, we have this bucket of anger that's built up from our childhood. And what we need to do is we need to hit a punching bag. And we need, to, we need to empty that bucket. We need to yell and scream. And we need to get all that anger out and empty that bucket. And then we'll be a lot better. Folks, the only problem with that, we don't have a bucket of anger. We have a factory of anger. And so, as soon as that bucket's full, the factory's done made a bunch more buckets of it. You're, you're, you keep creating that anger. It's not going to go away because you're expressing it. The Bible says in Psalms 15 and 1, a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. So you can't just blush that anger out. You just stir it up, keep it going, and you got the feuding of the hat, fields and the coins wherever. And it goes on and on. We all know this. Have you noticed that if you talk loud, the person next to you talks loud back? The louder you get, the louder they get. It escalates. So if you want to de-escalate anger in your relationship, in your marriage, friendships, whatever, you talk lower. You talk slower. Not loud and fast, low and slow. A gentle answer turns away wrath. It's a quiet anger. Whose anger does it quiet? First, it quiets your own anger. When you talk loud, it makes you angrier. When you talk low and slow, it makes you calmer. You calm down. What is the best way to deal with anger? I want to tell you, there are three ways you don't do it. One is you don't suppress it. You don't suppress it. You, you don't just stuff it down and stuff it down uh, and, you know, stomach it down and swallow it down. That's not going to work. Eventually, it's going to come out. It's going to come up. The second thing you don't do, you don't repress it. You know what repressed anger is called? It's called depression. There's a lot of people depressed, depressed in this time. They're depressed because all they do is sit around and watch depressing news stories about how horrible our country is and our, and our entire government and everything's down the drain. If I watch a show and it makes me angry, I'm not going to watch it no more, folks. I'm not. Take your anger to the polls. 
Take your anger to the poles. Don't sit around and watch depressing things and repress it. Do something positive with it. Get out and make a difference in your own communities. Take it to the poles and, and do something with it. But if you repress anger, it becomes depression. And that's why there's so many ads on TV for antidepressants because people are just packing it down. Let me give you a whole lot of marriage counseling in two words. It's called grow up. Most marital things can be solved. Uh, it's not incompatible with, you know, it's not marriage incompatible or not incompatible. Every time somebody gets divorced, it used to, they were incompatible. You know, when two Christians, there's no such thing as incompatible. There's immaturity, but not incompatible. Because two mature, Christian, loving people can find a way. They can find a way if they want to. If they're willing to be unselfish. And you know, and that's the thing, when anybody comes for counseling, we go, they go, well, do you see any help for our marriage? Well, we do if you do. I mean, we don't have a magic wand, but if you want to work on your marriage and you'll do it unselfishly and lovingly, and you'll get God's help, sure there's help. But if you don't care, you've already to the point that you're angry, you're apathetic, and you're alienated, you don't want to enter back into the conflict, it's not going to work, folks. It's not going to work. And so, you know, there are places where people get. You know, and even Moses realized there is a place that you can become so hard in your heart, you have no desire to work on it because the other person has no desire to work on it. And then there was the billing, the writing of divorce. But I'm going to tell you, in the first place, most of it can all be solved if we would turn and get to an unselfish place where we would enter back in and we would try to work on it. The third thing you don't do is you don't express it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell them like I want to do. You express it. When you express anger in an inappropriate ways, it damages relationships. And believe me, you may not ever get that relationship back if you express it, there's some things you can say to somebody that is so hurtful, they will never, ever forget it. They'll never forget it for the rest of their life. Every time they see you, they're going to think of what you said. And it's going to be so devastating, they're going to go, I can just not be married to that person anymore. What they said to me was so hurtful. You know, some of you have a black belt in sarcasm. You know, you do. You just When you get angry, your tongue is like kung fu tongue. You've got a degree in cold cuts, you know. You've got a deli mouth. You can just chop people, cut people all to pieces. Unless, you know, and, and if you don't watch it, that, that sarcasm can damage people. Uh, and it can damage people sometimes that kids will never forget what a parent has said to them. I, I've been in situations where a, a, a husband or a wife said, I don't love you. I've never loved you. I've never loved you. From the day we got married, I never loved you. Now, folks, that could have been at a point of anger or a point of frustration. But I'm going to tell you, three weeks later in a counseling session or, or, or ten months later, that person, no matter what's coming out of that person's mouth, all they can hear is, I don't love you, and I've never loved you, and I've never loved you even the day we got married. And that word, and maybe that spouse now would like to retract those words. They didn't really mean it. They said it because they were angry. Well, folks, that other person has heard it. It's deeply wounded them. And unless God helps them, they'll never get over it. And so when, when, you, when you just throw it all out there, sometimes it's not retractable. It, you can't get it back. And for those that think you're self-righteous and you never, you're Mary Martyr and you never said anything like that, but you get even uh, by other ways. Passive aggressive, you'll find other ways to get even. So you don't suppress it, you don't repress it, you don't express it. God says the way you deal with anger is you confess it. Confess it. You let it out to God. You admit it first to yourself. I'm angry. That's you start, you know, I'm angry. I'm really angry. I mean, that what happened today made me angry. I feel out of control. I, I, I feel like I feel like I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I feel like I'm scared. I'm insecure. I feel like handling this the wrong way. And I really feel that way. And God, if you don't help me, I'm probably going to do something wrong. So number five, the next step is the key to permanent long-term change. Is, you know, we have to be serious about it. Number five, we repattern your mind. 
You've got to repattern your mind. The Bible has a lot to teach us about this. You rethink and change the way you think. The way you express your anger, you didn't just get it overnight. You were taught that or you picked that up maybe by parents or some model or at school or somebody, your spouse. Somewhere along the line, you have picked up the wrong way and you've learned how to express anger the wrong way. The good news is, is for anybody that's learned to express anger the wrong way, there's all there you can be you can be retaught. You can relearn a new way of expressing anger. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Don't, don't do the way the world does. You know, the, the world says if somebody yells at you, you yell back. If they flip you off, you flip them off. If they pull a gun, you pull a gun. And that's the world. You see it in all the movies. You see it in all the things. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. God desires to change the way we think. I want you to get this. When you act in angry in an angry way, you might want to write this down. When you act in an angry way, it's because you feel angry. When you feel angry, it's because you're choosing to think angry thoughts. I'll tell you what, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I had something happen to me, made me so angry. I'm telling you, it made me angry. And I'm telling you, uh, the, the more I thought about it, the angrier I got. And I was just thinking, well, what can I do? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I just, it made me so angry. And so I had to, I had to clear, I had to get my mind on something else. Because every time my mind came back to it, I got angry. And it took me a couple, two or three days to get over it. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and I was thinking of all the things I could do, to, all the things I could do to get even, to get back. You've had that happen. How many of you had anger wake you up in the middle of the night? And you're just thinking, I'm going to get even. I'm going to get, I'm so mad. Well, I had to realize this is true. The reason you feel angry, you're thinking angry thoughts. So what you've got to do, you've got to let God help you start thinking different thoughts. Are you going to still feel angry and you're going to still be angry? You, and you're choosing, and that's what makes me so mad. A lot of people went out this morning, I think they were angry at this message. Because when you realize you're choosing to think thoughts that keep you angry. The way I think affects the way I feel. Every time I feel something, it's because I'm thinking of something. Every emotion you feel has a thought behind it. When you think this, when you're going to, you're going to feel this. If you feel depressed, it's because you're thinking depressed thoughts. The way I think determines the way I feel. The way I feel determines the way I act. So folks... You've got to stop it in the thought patterns. You've got to change the way you're thinking about certain things. And I choose to be around positive people. I don't like to be around negative people. Because pretty soon they'll cause me to be negative. If I think the thoughts of negative people, I'll be negative. If I listen to the thoughts of negative newscasts, pretty soon I'll be as negative as those newscasts. And I'm going to tell you something. When you start becoming angry and you feel angry, you lose 50% of your IQ, you could have a vote for the wrong person because you're stupid. <laughs> you lost all your brains because you're all stirred up. So if you want to change the way you act, you have to have, a, uh, you know, if you have a tendency to be abusive, to fly off the handle, to reach out, and show, you know, do some kind of physical violence. You, you don't focus on the behavior. You can't start where the behavior is. You've got to go back and you've got to start uh, not even to where you feel. Well, why did that make you feel? Well, they felt angry. That's why they done something violently. You, you've got to start changing. You've got to start changing what you were thinking. What was you thinking at the time that made you feel this way and caused you to act that way? What was you thinking? If you change that thought, that mental process, it's going to change your feeling. And if you change your feeling, it'll start changing your behavior. The Bible says be changed by, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And folks, only God can really help you do that. Keep away, the, the next verse says, keep away from angry, short-tempered people or you will learn to be like them. You'll be like them. You know, don't be around angry people. They'll make you angry. If you're dating someone right now that has fits of anger, you need to get out of that relationship. If you're engaged and you're around people with fits of anger, you need to get out of that engagement. You should not be in those kind of... You know, I know a lot of you think that, well, you know, when I, I, we'll get married and, and we'll walk the aisle down to the altar 
And you know, we'll sing a hymn, I'll alter him, but it's not going to work. <laughs> they need to be motivated now to get a hold of their anger. I want to tell you something else. You cannot change somebody else. You can't change your kids. You can't change a spouse. You can't change anybody. You know, the only person that can change them is themselves through the help of God. Don't be in a relationship where you're trying to change someone else. It will not work. Work on changing you. You work on changing you. You work on every day getting up and saying, I will not allow myself to be angry. You make a decision. You make a decision. It's sad to say in American, the, there's millions of American homes where last year four million wives were beaten by their husbands. Folks, you should never stay in a, an abusive relationship ever. The Bible says if you exploit or abuse your family, you will end up with a fistful of air. One of these people is going to come to nothing if they don't give over to God. The Bible says your husband must love your wives and never treat them harshly. So what do you do? How, you know, the thing is, is we've got to rely on God's help. None of us has the ability. If I've been preaching all these years and I know what the Bible says and I've uh, studied different anger management things and I still got mad two weeks ago and it stayed with me for two or three days, that says we all have to work on it. We all have to manage anger. And I can tell you, some of you got a whole lot more things to be angry about than I do. Romans 15 and 5 says, Patience and encouragement comes from God. Patience and encouragement comes from God. God can give you patience. God can encourage you. God can help you. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is patience. One of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. Whatever is in your heart determines what you will say. You know, whatever is in your heart is going to come out. It's whatever your mouth, your mouth is going to let you know what's in your heart. I want to give you a little thing here. If you find somebody and they have a harsh tongue, a cutting tongue, it reveals they've got an angry heart. They got an angry heart. If you find somebody and they got a negative tongue, they've got a fearful heart. They're negative because they're fearful. If you find somebody, they're always boasting. They're just boasting all the time. It's about them. They're boasting. They have an insecure heart. They're a very insecure person. If you find somebody and they're judgmental, they're always judging everybody around them. You know what it is? They've got a guilty heart and they think the only way to be better is put other people down. You know, you can put everybody down around you, but you haven't got any higher. You just put them down. It, it's, it's evident of a, of a judgmental heart. You, you have a, a, a judgmental heart if you're judging people. You, you have an, a, a, a guilty heart. And if you have a critical tongue and you're nagging all the time, it means you have a bitter heart. If you find somebody with a filthy tongue, it tells of an impure heart. So you, you, the mouth reveals the issues of the heart, what's in the heart. And, and so we need to get a hold. And so that's why Psalms says in Psalms 51 is if you don't like what's coming out of your mouth, you don't like the issues of the heart, he says in Psalms 51, you need to create in me, O oh Lord, a clean heart. God, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. We need a heart transplant. And the only way we're going to really get a handle on this is say, God, give me a new heart. Give me a clean heart. Give me a heart, Lord, that has patience. Let the fruit of the Spirit be alive in me. Let it be alive in me. If, if I'll give you a new heart. He says he'll put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stony heart from your body and I'll replace it with a heart that's God's will, not self-will. That's the heart we all need. That's a heart that we all need to be surrendered to, that heart after God, having a heart after God. Can we go to the Lord in prayer this time? How many would say today, as we are going to go into prayer, that you could use some help in the air of anger? Raise your hand. So many hands today, so honest and so open, folks. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, it would be almost impossible to live in this world and this society without without feeling sometimes angry. But Lord, your word tells us we can redirect our thoughts. We can think happier thoughts. We can think thoughts that don't make us feel angry and don't make us act out anger. And God, I pray that you would change our heart. Give us a new heart. If there be one here today, Lord, that is dealing with this very thing and they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, I pray today they'll say, Jesus, come into my heart. If you could fix my heart, come on in, Lord. Come into my heart and change me. Change my heart today. Change my ways today. 
Lord, I know I can't start with my behaviors first. I've got I to gotta change my heart and change my thinking. I've got to renew my mind. Lord, help me today to do that. Give me the strength. Give me the patience to be a person that's not filled with anger. Anger costs us all. It costs us friendships. It costs us relationships. It will cause us to be empty and alienated from everyone else if we don't get a hold of our anger. And God, today we thank you for this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming today. If you'd like to give this ministry, give an offering box is in the back or in the lobby. Have a great day. May the Lord just be with you. God bless you.